I hope you enjoyed that meditation. Uh, it's one of my favorites. You can find a version of this meditation on Insight Timer, which has programs from me on it, as well as from other teachers. And in that program, I do a five breaths meditation that moves from these three into uh, the green zone broadly, in which we're also rested in a feeling of peacefulness and contentment. So if you want to take it further from three to five, I welcome that. You know, so you're adding in the fourth breath, you know, let's say some sense of peacefulness in the present, whatever the future may hold, whatever the past has been, to the extent it's authentic, you can feel that there that you're safe enough in the present, in the core of your being, being, even if other things are swirling around you, and thus you can find a sense of calming and peacefulness. And in the fifth breath, even a sense of contentment, that there's an enoughness in the present, there can be gratitude and appreciation in the present, maybe a sense of accomplishing various things. In the present, it's enough. So we don't have to, as I talked about last week, start craving becoming of one thing or another, but instead can rest in being, infused with a feeling of contentment, an enjoyable sense of contentment. Contentment is a highly underrated experience, and one of its great values is that contentment really undermines craving, which the Buddha marked correctly as a, a major engine of suffering and harm, craving. So if you care to, you can add a sense of peacefulness and a sense of contentment to the feeling of connection that I highlighted in the second and third of the three breaths. I do like the simple three breaths, and I'm going to focus my talk on it tonight because it's a very accessible summary of much of the major elements of practice, especially when we unpack it. And it's a go-to. Who cannot take three breaths, right? So at least as long as you've got three breaths left in this life. We can always take those three breaths. And it's a very simple, secular, straightforward, and as I'll get into neurologically informed, um, a way of talking about practice for a general audience, if, if you care to do that with people in your life or maybe in your work three breaths. So I want to talk about the three breaths practice and frame it in the ways in which there are general themes involved in these three breaths that are really central to practice. Last week, I explored some stuff that might seem pretty cosmic, although it's right under our noses the whole time, which is to say the sense of the mind as a whole as a field or ground for experiences. And that field or ground is relatively stable if what goes through it is unstable. And we can rest in it. And we can rest in simply being. It gives us a sense of being. We can also find a sense of ground in an awareness of the nature of the Big Bang universe, kind of this, the field of the whole reality that we're local expressions of, and then third, the ground of the absolute, the unconditioned, the timeless, infinite mystery. Okay, that can all be a little out there, and every so often I think it's worth just going for it, right? Tonight, I want to focus on something very practical, very simple, very concrete, very close to our own experience. So in that first breath, we are breathing while feeling our chest as a whole. In you know, early Buddhism, uh, the teachings of the Buddha as best we know, he really emphasized um, establishing mindfulness in four major areas. And the first of these was the body. And in fact, there is an entire sutta or sutra dedicated to mindfulness of breathing, the Anapanasati Sutta. Sutta. And uh, so there's a lot of value in simply resting awareness in what Ajahn Brahm calls the beautiful breath. And you can simply get a sense of the ongoingness of breathing, which implicitly conveys a message that in this moment, at least, you're going on being, 
even if in the moment is challenging, there is still breathing. The heart is still beating. You're still going on being. So in this awareness of breathing, already we have mindfulness of the body. We're coming home to ourselves. We're embodied, good stuff. We're sustaining mindfulness in the present. As we are aware of the body, naturally that tends to decrease verbal activity because we're highlighting sensations, which are nonverbal. And as we highlight sensations and verbal activity gets quieter, we tend to get less hijacked by little trains of thought that want to, woof, take us on down the track on the express line. And suddenly we wake up <laughs> a few minutes later, whoa, where am I? I'm halfway to New Jersey. I had no idea, whoop, right? Verbal trains of thought tend to sweep us away. So deliberately focusing on sensations alone, the simple ongoing sensations of breathing, um, are a way to decrease verbal activity and to support present moment awareness, which is really valuable. Now here's an important detail. I had a friend who's also a somatic therapist uh, come up to me after I, I taught one time and said, Rick, you should know that for some people, the instruction to be aware of the breath is a trigger for them, particularly people with a trauma history, maybe with you know certain kinds of trauma that have involved uh, being unable to breathe. Uh, for example, I, I nearly drowned one time in kelp, and you know I, I have a feeling for wanting to breathe. Uh, that was a long time ago, and I think I survived. I am here. Okay, so if you don't want to pay attention to the breath, it's really okay. And I think it's good um, to be able to be willing to take initiative to change instructions to ones that really help you. So for myself, and I think also if, if you're listening to other, other teachers, um, and you want to shift from focus on the breath to focus on other body sensations, or even focus on something else that has a nice sense of continuity to it, maybe just a feeling for the, the volume of the space of the room that you're in the room as a whole, or maybe an image or a simple feeling like kindness or gratitude, uh, or a word like peace or shalom or shanti, just, oh, you know, whatever works for you, it's okay. But I'll keep focusing here on, on the suggestion to focus on the breath. So right there, breathing while feeling your chest as a whole, where you have the beginning, breathing, being aware of sensations, and second, as we're aware of the breath, which I mentioned a moment ago, we're tuning into this signal that's coming into the brain from the body, which is essentially like the call of a night watchman or woman or person, all is well. There is enough air in the moment. In this moment, in the present, you're basically all right, right now. There may also be pain, there may also be depressive mood, anxious mood, irritable mood. Um, there may also be preoccupations with uh, other countries or other beings, other people. It, it's okay. And still, at the center of it all, as we highlight the ongoingness of breathing, we're really tuning in to this reassuring message flowing into the brain, notably into a key part of the brain, the hypothalamus, that is involved in part with tracking the, the sense of the body with a signal, basically okay, basically okay. And that is wonderful in its own right, especially if a person is chronically anxious or needing to mobilize some resilience, you know, so that in the core of your being, there's a sense of doing basically okay in my core, which is a good basis for dealing with challenges. You know, this attunement to breathing is giving us that value just in and of itself. Pretty great so far. As the Buddha recommended, mindfulness of breathing. And when we talk about being aware of the chest as a whole, some additional interesting things happen. First, we're drawn into what's called Gestalt awareness 
or a sense of things as a whole, which we can also have when we take a bird's eye view or we have a big picture perspective or we tend to raise our gaze to the horizon line. All these are various ways to get a sense of things as a whole. When we get a sense of things as a whole, we tend to engage the hemisphere of the brain, of the cortex, that's involved with holistic, global, gestalt processing, which for right-handed people, like me, is typically the right hemisphere. It's switched for many left-handed people. The point is the same. We're tuning into that part of the brain that gives us a sense of things as a whole, which reduces activity in the other hemisphere of the brain, typically the left hemisphere for right-handed people, the, le the other hemisphere of the brain that's involved in sequential, step-by-step, -step, analytic kinds of activity, which is, of course, the basis for verbal activity. So that's why verbal processing centers for both receiving and generating language are in the left hemisphere for right-handed people. Nothing wrong with verbal processing per se, but it's a wonderful servant, yet a terrible master. Verbal activity, and I speak as someone who has some familiarity with that terrible master. So, you know, by letting that verbal activity quiet through awareness of things as a whole, that also helps us sustain present moment awareness. So we're less hijacked. That's good right there. Also, as we tune into the feeling of the chest as a whole, that naturally engages interoception. And interoception is that faculty we have to tune into ourselves, especially our internal sensations, like the sensations of breathing internally, not so much externally, like around the tip of the upper lip or the tip of the nose, but the internal sensations of the chest expanding, contracting, air flowing in, air flowing out. And as we tune into those internal sensations of the, in the chest as a whole, what that does wonderfully is engages a part of the brain called the insula, which acts like a circuit breaker and reduces activity in the part of the brain called the default mode network, kind of in the midline toward the rear, which is where we go when we're obsessing about things or daydreaming or dwelling on resentments or ruminating about anxieties or beating ourselves up or when we're really caught up in me, myself, and I. So interestingly, and you may have noticed this, when we tune into the sense of our chest as a whole and then our body as a whole, we come into the present more because we've reduced activity in the ruminator that does a lot of mental time travel, the default mode network. We come into the present. It's a good thing. And there's less sense of the self-contraction less sense of possessiveness, less sense of identification, less sense of getting caught up in the whole project of trying to impress other people with me, myself, and I. Wow. Breathing while feeling your chest as a whole. Now, in the beginning, for some, and this was true for me, it's hard to sustain that gestalt awareness of things as a whole in which many sensations are occurring. And my mind would naturally want to go pop, pop, pop from sensation to sensation to sensation. Took a little practice uh, helped by softening awareness and having a sense of receiving experiences, which aided the growing capacity, the development of kind of the trait capacity to be aware of the field as a whole, containing many little parts, many different sensations in this case. And you can extend that sense of the chest as a whole to your body as a whole. If it crumbles, you can come back to it. Um, you know, with practice, you'll be more able to rest there. Just that, breathing while feeling your chest as a whole. So right here, you can see so much of practice. Sustained present moment awareness, mindfulness, embodiment, gradual disengagement from yakety yak inner verbal activity, less and less swept away by that, 
more of a sense of peacefulness and reassurance in the present and less and less sense of a contracted ego, contracted me, myself, and I. Your being, simply being, not carried away by becoming, being. Breathing while feeling your chest as a whole, or if you like, expanding it to your whole body. All right. Now, then in the second breath, breathing while feeling caring. We have this very fundamental element in Buddhism, also found in other traditions and secular humanism, the principle of benevolence, of compassion, of the heart, bringing our heart, you know, <laughs> into the game, breathing while feeling caring. That, of course, taps into our deep capacities, biologically evolved as an enormously sociable primate. Now, to be sure, some of that sociability uh, is the capacity to be horrible toward other people. That's certainly part of it. In this practice, we are focusing on and therefore developing pro-social capabilities and feelings and inclinations by cultivating the practice of breathing while feeling caring. Interestingly, neurologically, as we tune into the sensations of the heart, we get this nice positive feedback cycle in which, on the one hand, um, as we tune into sensations in this part of the body, uh, there's, there's a kind of natural relaxing and calming of the body that feeds back up into the brain in part through the vagal nerve complex. <laughs> this is polyvagal theory, was, you know, developed a lot by Steve Porges, um, in which essentially, as we intensify awareness of a particular part of the body, in this case, the heart, we start engaging that um, vagus nerve complex more, and major portions of it rise up into the brain and are very involved with what's called the social engagement system of relationality. So literally tuning into breathing in the area of the heart, because the vagus nerve complex is very involved in regulating heartbeat. We're stimulating activity in that vagus nerve complex, which tends to make us more open to relationship. That's one direction. The other direction is, as we rest attention in the feeling of being with those that we care about in simple ways. I saw someone really cuddling their, their cat. I see another person right now with that really cool looking dog. Uh, there you are, uh, Jessica. Um, so, you know, when, when we do that, we're also mobilizing a lot of the social engagement system or kind of top down with our feelings and our emotions and our good intentions, you know, our good wishes toward other people. Um, you know, we don't have to like people to have good intentions toward them, to wish them well. Uh, so as we do that, the activity in the vagus nerve complex ripples downward and slows the heart rate, calms breathing and helps us feel more rested and peaceful in our own being, simply by breathing while feeling caring. Now, a little detail, you know, on demand, feel caring, <laughs> that can be a little challenging. But interestingly, as we develop traits of caring, broadly, traits of compassion, friendliness, kindness, love, respect, commitment to justice, commitment to welfare of others, as we develop those as traits, it's much easier to activate them or call upon them for states. And if it's difficult for you to just kind of drop into a state of being at will in a, after a few seconds of intention, no worries, totally normal, and probably kind of a clue that there's an opportunity there. Maybe, if unless it was just a one-off, you know, odd, just wasn't your day. But in general, if it's hard to 
generate certain states, you know, wholesome states of mind at will, that's a suggestion that it would be helpful to cultivate those more as traits over time and with practice. Okay, so here you are. Even if it's a little difficult, you can kind of help yourself find your way into a feeling, a way of being, and then you can dwell there. There's a lot of Buddhist practice, also found in other traditions, that's under the general heading of concentration practices or shamana practices, where we choose a particular object of attention. Maybe it's the sensations of breathing, or it could be a, an emotion, a kind of an emotional attitude of caring. And then what we do is we um, become absorbed into that wholesome state of being as we absorb it into ourselves. In fact, as we now increasingly understand through positive neuroplastic change, uh, you know, to kind of put it simply, where we repeatedly dwell, for better or worse, becomes over time what dwells within us. So as we, in formal practice or informally over the day, dwell in feelings of caring, while breathing, you know, or just simply feelings of caring in general, over time, we build up that as a trait. We build those, those up as traits, those aspects of caring, and that becomes increasingly what dwells within us. Increasingly unshakably in the core of our being, independent of what's happening around us. So breathing while feeling caring. So we have this very Buddhist theme of concentration, absorption, uh, de the development of certain qualities, very centered in Buddhism, and a quality that has a moral component in its benevolence and pro-sociality toward other beings. One last little point here about uh, breathing while feeling caring, another kind of theme as we move along in practice especially, is to move into what's called non-referential loving kindness or non-referential lovingness in which the caring, which is kind of my umbrella term in kind of plain speech here, caring, um, is non-specific. And one way to imagine this or to experience it is it's a little bit like I think of you're a Wi-Fi base station. You know, these base stations, like in our home, there's a modem somewhere, I guess, and it radiates a Wi-Fi signal to the house. It all seems like magic to me. It works great. Um, we become like, you know, loving kindness base stations or we're warm heartedness radiators. And so in a nonspecific way, for all kinds of good reasons, benefits to others and benefits to self, we kind of rest in a basic stance of good wishes, goodwill, friendliness. Um, we're not letting ourselves become a chump or a doormat, but there's a fundamental um, benevolence and, and a warm-heartedness and open-heartedness, certainly. And others move through that field. So increasingly, our own warm-heartedness is not contingent. It's not dependent on others. Yes, we set boundaries. We assert ourselves. We do what we need to do. We pursue justice. We defend ourselves. We defend those we care about. We defend our country as, as we need to do so while still resting in a kind of unilateral, unconditional um, loving kindness, even, uh, that other people move through. So that's, that's a really good thing, and that's a development in practice, breathing while feeling caring. And then last, a little challenging, breathing while feeling cared about. And <clears throat> it's interesting that sometimes people push away feeling cared about because somehow it, they think it's egoic, or more psychologically, it's in some sense, they push away being cared about because feeling cared about for them is associated with being betrayed. Maybe pre recently in adulthood or previously in their childhood, or feeling cared about and, and feeling cared about activates understandably, triggers longings to be cared about which in their history were associated with disappointment, perhaps betrayal, and then pain. So there's a kind of, uh, not so sure, I want to let myself feel cared about. You know, I've had people in my life who are a little bit like Trojan horses. You know, they came in all shiny and sweet talking and seemingly caring, got me to, you know, <laughs> open my gates, 
you know, lower the drawbridge and open the gates and let them in. And then ba-boom, you know, they tried to criticize and control me. Not so good. So, you know, there's can be some history here that makes it difficult for us to actually open to receiving caring. We might feel we don't deserve it or there's something wrong with us or it's just not for us or somehow it's culturally inappropriate or vain or selfish. Whatever those reasons may be, we can be mindful of them. And still, we can recognize that much as it is bedrock psychologically wholesome for other people to receive caring, we can see that other people are served by, and it's natural for them to feel liked or included, appreciated, wanted or loved, just like it's healthy for them, we can recognize, notwithstanding our fears, that it's healthy, it's wholesome. It's like drinking water. It's like eating food, psychological food, food for the heart when you're hungry. It's okay to receive this into ourselves. And that's very consistent with Buddhism. You can see the ways in which uh, the Buddha was very attentive, including his encouragement for people to be receptive to others in community, to uh, both express caring broadly and to receive it. And one of the reasons for receiving it is the ways in which it would be kind of rude, churlish, disrespectful to bat away the gifts of others. You know, we hold out our, our bowl in this case, the bowl of our heart, and we appreciate, you know, the sincere, obviously paying attention to whether the caring is sincere, usually it is, even if it's, you know, awkward or not exactly how you wish it would be, but fundamentally there's a sincerity in the caring often that comes to us. Um, we let it land in our bowl. We don't brush it away. We actually receive the caring, and then we help ourselves take it inside. And in so doing, interestingly, and I'm going to finish on this point, very central to Buddhist psychology, as we internalize that which is wholesome, including, notably, the caring of others, as we internalize it, we become less and less hungry for it. The internalization of healthy caring reduces craving for it. Wow. It's like if you're thirsty, if you're thirsty for love, understandably, and you drink the water of love, let's say, in terms of internalizing caring when it's real for you, you become less thirsty over time. Now, of course, uh, we don't have control over others being caring toward us. And many people, understandably, have histories of abuse, trauma, neglect. Uh, for structural societal reasons, many people are systematically mistreated or caring for them is really difficult to come by. I'm not trying to talk about, pos this is not positive thinking, this is not rose-colored glasses. I'm just saying that when there is an opportunity to recognize that in the present or the past that you've been included, seen, appreciated, liked or loved, when those are the facts in the present or the past, there's an opportunity to help yourself have an experience that's appropriate, proportionate to the facts of feeling included, seen, appreciated, liked, or loved. And if need be, and this is really okay to do, if need be, if you've had a, a life that's been pretty barren, of genuine caring and support, even simple forms of basic friendliness towards you. Um, you can imagine beings who are caring for you. If it's real for you, you can tune into or imagine existent beings. And you can also, in effect, through self-compassion, give yourself caring. And no matter what the source of it is, once you have that chance to feel that you're in effect receiving caring, then bingo, you've got an opportunity to internalize it. 
So we have a lot, really, of Buddha Dharma. We have a lot of sophisticated psychological, psychotherapeutic practice really summarized in these three simple breaths. Breathing while feeling your chest as a whole, breathing while feeling caring, and breathing while feeling cared about. I hope that practice is useful for you, and it's one that's been and continues to be really useful for me. All right, now I'm going to take a peek at the questions or comments that have come in in the chat. You don't have to use the chat sidebar, as I've mentioned. If you do use it, please um, you know, focus on your own practice and watch out for uh, advising or criticizing others. Also, you should know that uh, while I can't always read every single comment in real time, right, Ooh, uh, coming through the chat, uh, I always receive them. I always go through the chat afterward and read every single thing so you can know that I've really received that. Okay, let me just take a quick peek. A comment came in that's very understandable, saying, someone saying, I struggle with feeling caring for myself from early trauma. A common and, of course, painful uh, reality. Um, I try to fake it till I make it. And one of the things that I've really come to appreciate is that the more that a person's been neglected or traumatized, by other people, the more important it is to look for any port in the storm that's reasonably healthy, to look for any opportunity, including extremely simple ones, to feel that one exists in the minds of others, that they have neutral and ideally even positive intent toward oneself, including in extremely small ways, like very basic stuff, moving through you know, in a building, someone holds a door for you or keeps the elevator for you or looks at you with some warmth in their eyes. Very simple, even if it's a glance that only lasts three seconds. Or maybe there's a little bit of a jokiness with the person that you're, you know, at the cash register in the cafeteria where you're getting some food. Simple, simple, simple things. And this is manna, manna from heaven. This is really important to turn to. We're so social. We really need this food. And to give it to yourself, you know, again and again and again and again and again. And to give yourself the right to seek that kind of psychological food of recognizing the facts, typically mild in the flow of everyday life, sometimes, you know, more, more meaningful or, or, or intense for you. But to give yourself permission to look for those facts and to help yourself have appropriate experiences as, as, result, as a result. And again and again and again and again and again, that really does tend to uh, 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 you know, uh, open up those slots in the motherboard of our being so that experiences of being cared about can really land. All right. Let's see here. Great. I see a lot of great comments. Um, wonderful. Super. Great. Okay, I'm gonna call in two people. Uh, first, Catherine River Rain. Uh, hi, Catherine, and then Dana or Donna. So Catherine, welcome back. I'm asking you to unmute. You know the usual drill, please be succinct. I say this for others, you know it. Please be succinct if I call on you and focus on what I'm talking about tonight. Okay. Hi. Hey. Oh, thank you, that was great. Um, like you were saying, I, f I found the last part difficult the the receiving and i did literally feel it in the chest ah, I, God. yeah what i was curious about is um from your research like how how sustained would we have to do something like this to really start working on the previous trauma because you know you get many moments that reinforce the connection but then you can still get equal things that keep reinforcing the other in life you know yeah. Um, yeah. That That is such a central question. And to be clear about myself, I consume a lot of research. I produce very little. And I have a lot of respect for people who do generate research. So I just kind of want to be, be modest here about that. Um, the, you're asking a very fundamental question, which is kind of the dosing effect. And boy, even in... Uh, medicine, where we're dealing with just pure physiology and 
chemicals that can be very regulated. There's a lot of individual variation and even a lot of um, unclarity still about what the proper doses of things are to get a beneficial result. So in that context then, what I have found at a very human level is one, don't reinforce the crud. Right? Just that alone, if people stopped ruminating in the negative and stopped walking into the pain room, putting it bluntly, you know, very briefly, you may have heard me make this joke uh, once before. I, I listened, I watched a friend once joking with his with someone else that he felt he'd, you know, forgive my language here, he felt he'd had his head up his ass the whole day. And his other friend responded, yeah, but it's great to be home again. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so uh, Freud talked about the repetition compulsion. And uh, there is that tendency uh, in us, you know, to go back to the pain room just because it's familiar. You know, it's what we know. Understandable as that is, one major way to help ourselves is to reduce the reinforcement of the pain. Now, a key here is we're not suppressing it. It's not that we're fighting the pain room. If we find ourselves feeling that pain, the faster we move to mindfulness of it, then we're not reinforcing it. Because with spacious awareness, mindfulness of it, and a sense of the establishing of a, of a beingness position, a kind of core of being calm, you know, witnessing, a kind of a calm and undisturbed witnessing of the disturbances, you know, roaring through the mind, right there, we are um, disrupting the reinforcement and in fact, starting to associate a kind of a calm, spacious, peaceful uh, ongoingness of being with the pain and thus easing it over time. So just that, just that, you know, getting on your own side and being serious about it. It's sort of like you realize, you know, it hurts. I don't want to do that. Stay out of the pain room as much as you can. And if you find yourself there, 10 times a day, walk out of the room 10 times a day. That, that makes a huge difference over time. Second, really look for internalization opportunities. Really, Catherine, I would scale it at five minutes a day, really, total. That's a lot. That's five more minutes than most people will give it any day, where a breath here, a few minutes of meditation there, you really marinate in the internalization of beneficial experiences that are the natural antidotes to, or medicine for, or the long overdue healthy supplies today that you should have received as a kid but didn't. They were missing. There was a lack, a deficit. You know, really, most people will not give it five minutes a day, just here and there. If you're actually experientially, emotionally and somatically, marinating in beneficial positive experiences in the ways that I've taught a lot about. You're taking them in. You're taking in the good. You're resting in that. That can have a lot of impact over time. And then last, additionally, and it, it may help to do even more than that, but that can have a lot of impact. Additionally, sometimes with a counselor, with professional guidance, you can do what I call linking in the HEAL, H-E-A-L framework I have, you're familiar with it, in which we're aware of positive and negative at once, in which you start to have more and more experiences in which the beneficial material is prominent in your awareness, and it starts to associate with the deficits or lacks inside you or the wounds inside you that that beneficial material is well matched to, such, like, such as having you know, a clear experience of feeling cared about in the foreground of awareness, while off to the side are feelings from childhood, perhaps, of not being cared about, or in fact, being mistreated. We're not trying to make up something. We're not trying to um, erase the memories. We'll remember what happened. But over time, through that linking association that I did not invent, it's central to many trauma therapies, um, the charge gradually eases on that old material. And that's a very helpful process. So, you know, realistically, if you disrupted the reinforcement most times in the day, while also clocking 
here and there over the course of the day, five-ish minutes of marinating in the positive and internalizing it, and maybe once or twice over the course of the day, having a sense of linking for half a minute or maybe a minute or longer, that I would consider to be a lot of regular practice, particularly if it's done day after day after day. And if that alone, does, if you're doing that sincerely and that alone isn't really budging major material, then definitely I think it's appropriate to talk with a good professional about what would take you and help you go to the next level. Okay? Good. All right. Thanks, Catherine. And I think you've muted yourself. So Dana, Donna, how do you pronounce your name? I'm asking you to unmute. Great. It's my mother's maiden name, Dana. Oh, excellent. Okay, great. Uh, although I appreciate my name over the bowl of money. That always, you know. <laughs> Donna, the term for generosity, as you well know, from early Buddhism. Great. Okay. So um, my question is about burnout. Yeah. And I, um, I'll preface this to say that I've been um, fortunate and grateful to be an artist my whole life. Um, mm. I have a CV, CV that's impressive, including uh, one-person shows and stuff. However, it's very difficult to make a living as a fine artist. We all know. Yeah. And so um, before COVID, I taught, uh, I spent a little time teaching children ceramics. Well, when COVID hit um, and children had nowhere to go and parents were losing their minds, I opened up my driveway. And um, I now have 86 children a week in my driveway. And so, <laughs> Yeah, probably. you have a book right there, the magical driveway or something like that. I could just see it <laughs> in my mind's eye. Okay, all right, keep going, keep going. The deal is, um, you know, I'm grateful for that, and I'm not doing it for free. You know, yeah. I'm getting paid; it's lucrative, and I've been um, connected with a lot of people. And especially in the beginning, when COVID was, you know, the way it was, I was really the go-to place. I'm so burnt out. Like when you said care about people, like I just, I finished two mm. classes a day and I was like, I cannot care about another person, like yeah. caring about people for a living. And I know there are people who are nurses and stuff like that, but I've gotten to the point where it um, it's interfering with my work. I just feel like I need to stop it. I, 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 I just am so busy inspiring others. And also, I used to teach art at Esalen. So, I mean, I've been inspiring others for a while, and I just feel like I need to inspire myself. I'm burnt out with caring. Well, Dana, it, I get it. It sounds like you have wisdom for yourself here, <laughs> and this is an But I think a lot of people are to, in this situation. Oh, yeah, and especially, gosh, what a surprise. You're a woman. Uh, and I just think about social structure. It's, you know, as soon as you generalize about gender, it's, you know, a minefield. But that said, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I can say that just factually, my own little personal sample of, as a long time, you know, public speaker, workshop leader, so forth. Uh, I've, I've heard countless women talk about feeling overcared about, overcared, I don't know, the burned out, let's say. And, I've never heard a man talk about it. Now, I'm sure it's true, and uh, but just as a bit of a report. Well, I can't give you any advice about what to do concretely. You know, I'm thinking about those kids. I will say one thing. There's interesting recent research about the difference between empathy and compassion in terms of burnout. And it could be, I'm just thinking out loud here, that you're just overbooked. and Maybe like me, you're more of an introvert, probably pretty common among artists, maybe. And you're just clocking too. There's just too much traffic running through your mind. You can do it. You're strong. But it's not your nature to have that much interpersonal traffic running through. You need quieter or you need more respite or you need briefer periods in which you're dropped into rush hour traffic in L.A. interpersonally with other people, including with Wonderful kids, but still, there's a lot going on there. So that pops out for me as a something. The other thing that pops out is from research, just the fact that uh, compassion, more of a pro-social happy feeling, is actually quite rewarding. And it's interesting that I would just kind of wonder if for you, while you're doing this, are you having fun? Are you getting fed along the way? 
And is there, are there, might there be any little adjustments that could be made in along those ways? And I think that's a point I'm making really for everybody who, you know, who's still here and I'll be wrapping up momentarily. Um, you know, can we help ourselves enjoy what we're doing, including in pretty juicy, you know, even somatic, emotional ways to help ourselves really enjoy it and be playful about it. I sense in you, you know, a real playful spirit. Can you can you unleash that playfulness, uh, which then can feed us more along the way, so we're less we, we less come to the end of the day feeling like we're running on empty. I'll just offer those to see, you know, and you see if they're if they're useful at all for you. Very useful. Thank you. Oh well, yeah, that's great. And what a cool driveway. You know, you got another project here. Write that book. You know. Anyway, the magical driveway. <laughs> the, I don't know what. I'm looking for a D, you know, the delightful driveway. I don't know, something. Okay. All right. So, Aaron, I'm going to do this real fast with you, and then we're going to wrap up. So I, for, please forgive me coming in. We've just got to wrap up soon. Okay, Aaron. Sure. It's a real quick one. Um, you often talk about space and being spacious and opening to yeah. spaciousness. Uh, for me, you know, feeling spatial uh, relationships between parts of my body or, you know, when you asked us to uh, feel the space of our chest, it really triggered something. What, what do you, you know, other than just being a non, taking you to a nonverbal place, what is it about space? And what did it trigger? Just, um, it kind of takes me into a very um, contemplative, um, relaxed, very um, open um, place. And I, and I found that with other um, exercises, not just the one that you walked yeah. us through. Well, I think you're, you know, neuroscience is a baby science. I don't want to over infer from it, but to me, you're describing a kind of um, strong, useful response to that cue that neurologically probably involves, um, as I've kind of said, a reduction of verbal activity. Uh, reduction of self-referential processing. And both of those tend to carry a lot of dukkha, a lot of suffering, right? And so instantly, it's like a circuit breaker. And um, I think also that there's a way in which, in addition to the neurological razzmatazz here, that when we go, in effect, when we go into spaciousness, we're going into the, uh, the ground in which the figures of different thoughts, feelings, desires, little mental movies are occurring, but we're moving into the field, the field of experience. And that gets closer to our true nature as a field of being in which doing proceeds, a field of being in which becoming appears and passes away. So you're coming home in a really powerful way. And you know, when someone has such a marked reaction to to a to a suggestion, that's that's a good sign of um, a capability, you know, in in a person's practice. So I I just kind of leave you with that. Now, there are a lot of traditional meditative instructions. You especially get them, I think, in Tibetan Buddhism and the Buddhist tradition, where the instruction is sky gazing or a sense of the volume of the room rather than any objects in it a sense of the, the totality, the whole. Uh, you know, the reasons why people have uh, made these suggestions that we're now understanding, you know, in terms of the underlying neurobiology of it. So I'll just leave it there, and it sounds like it's really working for you. Well, yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate oh. your insight on that. Oh, thank you. You might like, in particular, the chapter on uh, wholeness and allness, the two chapters in my book, Neurodharma. Uh, if you haven't seen them or seen that book, Wholeness and Allness, because it really speaks to this territory. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.